uh, in the interests of time. Uh, so, uh, Brad, introduce yourself and on with the show. All righty. Does that, does that show up for folks? I'm seeing nodding or no, no dissent. All right. Um, today, I'm going to talk about micro e forth on the web. I'm actually going to adjust this so that I can see my slides are better yet. Let me hide that entirely. There we go. All right. So micro e forth um, is related to ESP 32 fourth, which you've heard me talk a bunch about. It's a, uh, a version of, it's, uh, they're really one and the same, uh, built from the same source base. ESP32 fourth is the, the variant that, that targets ESP32. And we, we've branded it that way to, to, to make it clear to folks, but um, uh, it's, a, it's an E fourth with a minimal amount of non fourth code in it, which is, is a weird thing to say for a, a fourth that's uh, created in C. It tries to have minimal redundancy so that you don't end up having to describe an opcode once in its code and another time in some table somewhere. It tries to make it possible to add one line of code to add an opcode to the system. The kernel is compiled from inline fourth text. So at startup, it, it does the sort of inefficient thing of booting up the system from fourth text, but it does this in service of the goal of having as little non-fourth as possible in the system. And there's support for Windows, Linux, ESP32, and finally, after uh, a long delay, the web. Originally, when I had started working on this particular fourth kernel, I had intended to have web support, and a number of uh, things got in the way, not least of which is that uh, I think that trying to do all those things in one code base may not have been the best choice, but I'll talk about that as we go through it. Why the web? Um, the web is, is portable and powerful. It offers a rich set of APIs that let you do all sorts of things uh, from access the, the graphics of your device to um, local files. If there are APIs for, for local files, there are APIs for uh, even serial uh, access now. Uh, so you can do quite a lot on the web. Uh, it's also possible on the web to go fast. The, the days of JavaScript as sort of the only path to do a thing on the web are, are over. And due to uh, things like WebAssembly, you, you can now in all, all the major browsers uh, run very performant code. Uh, there was a precursor to WebAssembly called ASM.js, which uh, I've made some use of in this uh, in this uh, application, which I'll talk about, uh, and has the virtue that in uh, Chrome, at least, when you uh, when you have ASM.js, it actually will get converted underneath uh, to WebAssembly. I know this because I happen to have been the one that that implemented uh, the the version that's that's uh, lives in V8 now. Um, and it's similar, but not exactly the same, at least as I understand it in Firefox and some of the other browsers. Um, the other great thing about the web is that it's easy to show people things. Uh, I, can, I can hand out a URL and, and folks can go there. And, and this relates to the second point, which is that people don't have to trust me. If you download the version of uh, micro e for Windows, Unfortunately, you will probably get some uh, security alerts from running it. And this is because uh, I have not signed the binaries on Windows. And uh, the, uh, the antivirus uh, systems that are out there look at uh, the, you know, the small uh, headers on a piece of fourth code and think that this looks, looks kind of questionable. And the combination of a lack of a signature and all of that means that it uh, it will warn you about running it. And unfortunately, this is a problem that uh, versions of uh, Win32 Win fourth face as well. Um, in comparison, uh, the web, I can just show you a URL. And I actually, at the end of this presentation, I'll, I'll encourage you all to check, check out uh, what I put up. So the overall approach in micro e fourth is that I try to make each opcode 
be something that I can define in just a, a one or two lines of C code. And the goal is to have a reasonable list of opcodes. Originally, I kind of focused on the minimal set similar to classic e but especially if you look at the, the current version, there's a number of additional opcodes that have been added. I have added as many as I have partially because on ESP32, this has the advantage that uh, opcodes implemented in C end up taking less of the RAM of the, the system. They, they can end up in flash memory. And so more memory becomes available for the running application. After you define those opcodes, you're able to use a very small set of system variables that C sees in a, in a, um, uh, in a structure. Uh, and those same variables are accessible from Ford. And then the key idea is that there are five core opcodes that are non-trivial, that don't fit in one or two lines, that uh, are implemented in larger C functions. They, these are function, these are opcodes that could be built from uh, the other opcodes, because the other opcodes are sort of fully general. But they're done uh, in high-level C code because they allow the fun trick that with those five, you have enough of the fourth system in place that you can boot the rest of the system uh, from there on out with four. And so they're carefully chosen to be um, sort of the, the crucial building blocks to have a full fourth system. Um, and they also sidestep another problem, which is that if you have to assemble loops, you, you very quickly get into the problem that uh, you now need an assembler to, to bootstrap that part of your system. So they both serve the purpose of being crucial to executing fourth code, but also uh, they avoid needing to, uh, to, to have any kind of mechanism for, for assembly. Uh, and then the rest of the system is in fourth. So there are some design choices that are in micro e fourth that are not fundamental to that that model. Uh, it happens to be indirect threaded just because that's what I did at the time. Partially, this is because um, I, uh, in it being a fourth implemented in C, it needs some type of opcode that's explicitly stored. And I found it um, more convenient to have these live in a cell. I didn't want them to be direct threaded and live inline. Um, there isn't really. Uh, there isn't a real architecture underneath on when you're targeting C, you're targeting the sort of the C virtual machine. And so it made sense to me to, to do an indirect threaded fourth. Um, also, it makes words like C and does a little bit simpler. One other thing is that uh, a truly direct threaded fourth would have challenges, especially if I wanted to interoperate with machine code. Uh, being done in C, but an indirect threaded fourth in uh, the Linux version and in the ESP32 version uh, can use computed go-tos uh, available in, in, those com in, the, in those compilers, even though that, that isn't actually a, a standard C feature, it's present in the vast majority of C compilers. Um, and that avoids there being any in the assembly language. Um, it's possible other models might go faster, especially on the web. I've, I've wondered if it's the right model, but uh, that, that is what it is for now. It uses unlimited stacks. This is a place where I, I deviate from some of Dr. Ting's uh, uh, choices. This, this is a mixed, uh, mixed bag. I did this because uh, it, uh, it was what was present in the original E4 model. Um, one thing that it lacks, especially on ESP32, that, uh, that I uh, sometimes regret, especially when it, when the thing crashes, uh, is that uh, by allowing the stack to be anywhere in memory, uh, you can easily run amok with the stack. Um, Dr. Ting used a, a fun trick of uh, using only a bite-sized pointer for the stacks uh, and having them wrap around, which uh, uh, avoids the stack getting, getting uh, off the rails. Um, I support 32-bit float uh, floating point values. Um, and this is primarily because e this was a feature that ESP32 has. It, I don't do 64-bit floats because ESP32 doesn't have them uh, in, in hardware. Um, also, it, it, it's with an eye to eventually, uh, I plan to get back to my deep learning uh, in fourth talk and, and hope to uh, make use of micro e fourth for that. Um, and it, it tends to use um, uh, avoid counted strings just because it happened to fall out that way. So how does, how is the system built up? Um, 
we'll go through the C version because as you'll see in a moment, the, the, the web version uh, is actually converted from that version. Um, there's a small set of registers that you have to decide. And let's talk about what each of them are for. There's an instruction pointer. There's a return stack pointer. There's a data stack pointer. And then I keep a, the top of stack in a, in a register or a virtual register as it is all through a layer of abstraction. There's a work uh, register that uh, as next operates, it uh, first loads the, uh, the address uh, pointed to by the instruction pointer into the work, ad, uh, the work uh, register. Uh, and so uh, that can be useful for gluing things together, for example, in does. Um, there's a floating stack pointer. And then uh, I ended up needing a single temp float value. I define in C a bunch of convenience um, operations that uh, implement uh, some of the core stack ma manipulation. These end up being reused in the opcodes rather than uh, sort of have uh, less readable C code there. Uh, some of the, the variable length ones are, are more useful for ESP32 forth where uh, some of the bindings are um, for, for calling into libraries uh, make these useful. They're not actually that useful in the, in the kernel. Um, and then the outer structure of, of the thing uh, is really built, built around the idea that you want to run your fourth, and then you might actually need to yield back to the system. On ESP32, you need to yield back to the system because some of the libraries assume that uh, you will return control back to the, the thing that called in. Um, and on the web, this is even more important because the web uh, has a, a, a sort of an event loop that if you don't return to a number of things uh, get gummed up. And so for that reason, it's important to have the, the fourth be structured such that you can have a, a yield word that parks the interpreter and, and yields back out to the system. So you, everything uh, when you enter is, is sitting on the return stack. Uh, you unpark uh, things, which works sort of like this where you pull out the instruction pointer, the stack pointer, the, the floating pointer, the stack pointer, and then unbox the, the top of the stack. Um, and then uh, if you need to yield, uh, or when you do eventually need to yield, you, you, uh, you park the, uh, everything uh, so that you only have to hold on to that single return stack value to, to find your place back. Um, to be able to define the opcodes in, in a single line, I use a, uh, a C trick called a, an X macro. This lets you define a list of um, a list inside of a series of macro calls, and it lets you encode a table of information. You can then reuse portions of the list in multiple different places. So the way this works is that I can define an opcode uh, all on one line by describing the, the string that, uh, uh, that is its name and forth. I have to give it a C name because it's useful to be able to have it uh, uh, for defining lists of opcode uh, constants and things like that. I wish I didn't have to do this because it's actually redundant, um, but I have not found a way around that. And then there is a, uh, and then there's the code in C that implements uh, the opcode. Um, and then I can use that uh, a list of opcodes described in that way, for example, if platform opcode list were described that way, I can populate an enumerated type pulling out just the, uh, the opcode name and prefixing it with a, a, a name if I, if I need to. Or later in, this, is, this code is actually from the Windows uh, version. Uh, when I want to switch and dispatch in the, in the core of the interpreter, uh, I can just uh, describe my next operation and then have all the opcodes be played out. And I end up not needing to list them each in each of these places because I have that shared list. I then, um, for convenience, I'm able to define a set of um, alternate short names that uh, let me define just the name and the code for a word. Um, the, the reason for this distinction is that uh, some words uh, are valid uh, C identifiers and others are not. And so to make things a little more pithy, I'll use this Y label to define words like and uh, that happen to be valid C identifiers. But for words like uh, C at, where it would not be a valid C identifier, I have to make up some C name for it. And then I have the code in one line. Um, 
because I defined dupe as a macro, it causes problems. And so I end up having to treat dupe uh, specially. Uh, but it's very, very handy to have a dupe macro. If I were really clever, I suppose I'd come up with a different name uh, for the dupe macro when used in, in this way. Uh, but anyways, in, in that way, I'm able to describe all of the opcodes uh, that I need to define uh, uh, the core of the fourth. Um, and I do have some other variations. Um, if you go looking at the, the source code for micro e fourth, there's a little additional complexity I'm, I'm skipping over because of vocabularies. I ended up originally it was just these x and y macros, um, but when I, uh, it, I and I implemented vocabularies purely in high level fourth. Um, as I got got along um, in ESP32 fourth, it became useful to have more of the vocabulary mechanism live. Uh, in the C code. And so uh, there's, uh, I transitioned some of that uh, into the C code because it was uh, convenient to, uh, or sorry, rather more efficient for ESP32 fourth. More of it ends up in flash memory. Anyways, um, once you've defined your opcodes, um, all you need to do fourth is, is, uh, is this core loop. You, your quit is just a, a forever loop that uh, evaluates a single word. Now, the, 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 of course, the challenge is how do you define that evaluate one operation? So here are those five magic words I was talking about. Um, they have a dependency, each of them, on some of the, um, the system variables. Uh, and so the, on the right are the system variables, and on the left are the, the five magic words. The first of these um, is a word to parse a number. Um, and so it takes uh, a string and attempts to parse it into uh, a legitimate number. For that, it needs to know the base. Um, this is, uh, as you'll see in a moment, relatively straightforward to do in high-level C code and avoids having to, to describe that using, using fourth opcodes. Parse uh, parses and finds uh, boundaries to the next word and updates the, uh, the in pointer and, and uh, so on, reading from the, uh, the translation input block. Um, creation of a word is a little bit more complex than one line, line just because you have to hook things uh, into place and, and build up the dictionary structure. And then finding a word similarly, because it involves string comparisons and, and so on, it's, it's nice to have that uh, as a high level word. And then those four words are used in, to implement evaluate one based on the current state. Uh, and if a word is not found, they call into back into uh, a, a deferred word that's stored in uh, in not found. And that initially is drop, but later on turns into throw, uh, which which lets me avoid needing to have throw there when the system is booting. So I, I'm not going to show each of them, but I'll show the parse word and the parse word. Uh, relies on this little separate function, which could be folded in, but uh, a word for matching, uh, deciding if, a, if two characters are a match, and then it uh, walks down and, and uh, uh, finds the boundary um, uh, to, for the next word. Um, once you have those five and that evaluation loop, which please check out details in the source space, um, you can then boot from a string. Um, you, you can end up, you can set the the, the, uh, the tib to point to uh, a gigantic C string that contains uh, all of your fourth bootstrapping code and everything else uh, gets, it's built up from there. The first thing that gets defined is comments because initially comments aren't supported and you need comments to, to be able to use comments in the rest of the code. Um, and uh, I, I won't belabor that, but it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a fascinating sort of ordering in which you can, you can do things to bring the world up. Well, how do we bring this to the web? Well, the, the simple answer is I, I convert this to ASM.js. Now, there, there is a set of tooling that exists to do this, a, a, a great tool by a, a person I, I actually know uh, named Alon Zakai uh, called Inscriptin. Um, but it's a big pile of tools and involves LLVM and is, is uh, uh, a lot of stuff, especially for my, my small program. And so I, I tried something different. I hand converted the five core words uh, to, to ASM.js because they're just sort of special enough that, uh, and, but there's only, they're, you know, they're only similar to, to what you saw with, with uh, parse here. They're basically each a screenful. Um, and then I tried to come up with a set of uh, automation to, to convert the opcodes. And we'll talk about that in a sec. So ASM.js, I should 
talk about it for a second. It's, it's definitely the best hack I've ever seen. Uh, it, it's the idea of embedding C code in JavaScript, which seems counterintuitive. And it does this by um, uh, representing C semantics in, uh, inside of JavaScript. Um, and inside of Chrome, at least, this gets converted to WebAssembly, which is yet another format, which I won't talk about today. Uh, which then gets converted actually into into real assembly and runs at, at with you know near native speeds. But the the the, the cleverness of the hack of ASM.js is that uh, JavaScript uh, represents values uh, with um, uh, data types that are um, not strong but rather uh, rather weak, and so they are able to. Um, you can have a in a variable. It can hold a, a string, or it can hold an, uh, an integer, or it can hold a floating point value. And in fact, actually, numbers in JavaScript are always uh, double precision floating point values, whether you sort of want them to be or not. And in a, with the the trick of ASM.js is that you use a sort of redundant syntax where you incessantly or things with zero, for example, to indicate that something is a a 32-bit integer. Or you use this operation f round, which rounds to the precision of a 32-bit floating point value to indicate that something is a 32-bit floating point value. And so in this way, you're able to override the semantics of JavaScript such that, uh, that you're making it clear throughout your code that, uh, that everything, uh, that a given variable is a 32-bit uh, floating point value, for example. So it looks wasteful. But to a, a, a JavaScript interpreter that knows how to decode it, uh, it can be converted into efficient code. Um, it is largely de uh, been superseded by WebAssembly, but for uh, the purpose of generating a thing by hand, it's a little bit easier to generate by hand because it's human readable text and doesn't require additional tooling. So that's what I ended up doing. And so here's that same parse uh, code uh, re-expressed in ASM.js. The memory accesses are relative to some uh, arrays that uh, are uh, contain the entire memory map. And a similar thing was done to each of these. The rest of the system is glued, and I noticed there's a question in the chat, so I'll maybe take that. Oh, he's got a reference, never mind. Um, the rest of the system uh, could, in C, could be built up with includes, uh, but I actually do it with a combination of make files and some scripts for gluing it together. And the reason that I do this is that for the ESP32 version of uh, micro E4, um, it's desirable to have it in one gigantic uh, INO file. Um, and I didn't want the, the, the sort of side effects that you get from using the, the C preprocessor to, to include a file. And so um, I, uh, I structured it uh, using these scripts. That ends up being useful because I can then use uh, those same scripts to do some replacement patterns to try to convert all of the opcodes. And so I do something oops, I do something like this. I go through and have a series of replacements. And some of these, these are actually all string replacements, but a few of them are regular expressions, where I replace C code with the equivalent uh, ASM.js uh, JavaScript code. And the, the motivation here is that I hoped to be able to avoid uh, needing to update uh, ASM.js code when I change the C code. Unfortunately, um, as uh, I've relearned the lesson, it's a classic lesson that, that a sort of a badly implemented uh, compiler done with string substitution is, is not a good idea. Um, 140 lines of replacements end up being required to, to handle all the opcodes I have. And the base opcodes are, there's 150 lines of them. So it's not much of a win. There, there are some additional opcodes that are added to support uh, the efficiency of bringing more of the, the system inside. So it is a net win in total, but not by much of a margin. And so probably this is something I should revisit. Probably would be worth just maintaining two, two separate uh, descriptions of, of the opcodes um, that, are, that are do a proper compiler but, or, or, use, or use them scripting. Um, Talking to the outside. So on the web, of course, I have one more problem. I've got my great in interpreter, it runs, but now how do I talk to the outside world? Well, I uh, have a list of, I have only a single opcode that I use for this. I called it call, confusingly. And call calls into JavaScript, passing in uh, the fourth stack as a parameter, which lets JavaScript decide how to interpret this. And then I start out with a table of 
JavaScript objects uh, that contain uh, what, I, what I'll term system calls. And so the first of these is a thing called set eval, which takes uh, a three, three values. It takes the, uh, the starting pointer of a, a string in the fourth memory space, a length of that string, and then the index of a, a slot in this objects array in JavaScript that I want to populate with the result of ev evaling that piece of JavaScript. So this lets me take a piece of JavaScript code in a string and forth, hand it over to, uh, to, to JavaScript, evaluate it, and store it in this array. And uh, when I make a call, I call into uh, a particular index, my system call number, in this table. And so this lets me, from forth, define uh, pass strings into JavaScript to define the, the remaining opcodes. And so, for example, this is the, the implementation of a key question mark, where I have a JavaScript function that interacts with uh, sort of the outside world and JavaScript's APIs to, uh, to cope with uh, trying to check the input buffer if there, for if there's a key. Um, I have a, this little shortcut here for read line. I have two modes of operation, which I, I won't talk about at length, but there's a way to run a JavaScript interpreter at the command line, and I also support that. Um, and so I'm able to create this, this uh, system call binding all in fourth code and, and uh, I hook things up. Um, and and, and that's the, that, that I've done that for uh, sort of terminal input and output and even a little bit of graphics as we'll see in a moment. And to use the interpreter, um, it's all in one giant JavaScript file. If you want to embed the interpreter somewhere, you can specify a, a div tag with a particular ID and it will uh, inject the interpreter there if it doesn't Find that tag, it will just happily embed it at the bottom of the page. Um, there are some caveats. Um, star slash mod, as you'll see, I'll show you in a second, is, is a lie. I, I have not implemented it properly. Uh, it's on my list of things to fix, but I haven't done it yet. Uh, I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, the ASM.js heap size is fixed. I, I think I picked maybe 16 megabytes of memory. It's a little large, but uh, it, it's a canned value, which is not ideal. If I use WebAssembly, WebAssembly does support a dynamic heap. The terminal is too slow, and it's just because I haven't had time to optimize it. I'm using uh, the JavaScript that I'm using to update it uh, is, is less than ideal. And I lied, actually. Um, because of floating point support, there's actually a sixth core op code that's required the, the conversion to uh, from a string to a float, floating point value. Uh, it's not strictly required if you were if you wanted to strip out the floating point support, but it is required. Uh, it, it is used in the current system. Um, star slash mod is uh, is implemented with this piece of JavaScript code right now. Um, and this is not right because what it's doing is it's, uh, you know, star slash mod right should take a times b and then divide by c and return the, um, the division result and the modulo result. Uh, it's supposed to extend it to a double word size, but unfortunately there is, uh, although there is a, uh, there is actually a brand new 64-bit, uh, uh, actually arbitrary precision uh, type in, in JavaScript, uh, I'm not confident in the browser support to, to make use of it here. I, I'll actually have to check up on that before I fix this problem. So for now, I'm converting everything to 64-bit floating point and doing the division. And so you can end up with some imprecision. Um, so uh, the right way to fix this is either to use that arbitrary precision type, or I will probably need to eventually, uh, or an alternative is you can you can sort of do the, the bit shifts and, and, and the tricks to do divide correctly. Um, there are many happy things of this implementation. One is that I, I, I was able to quickly throw in a little bit of graphics, not quite as much. Not, I had hoped to be able to run the, the heart game I demoed many times back, but I'm not quite there yet. Um, but I got some of the pieces. Um, and the other great thing is that this implementation is likely to be reasonably fast and, and be able to do some interesting graphics because uh, the memory space is something that you can pass over to WebGL and, and do fun things. So with that, I'm going to switch over and do a quick demo. Um, any of you can find this. If you go to uh, the easiest way to get there is just eforth.appspot.com. Um, and if you click uh, to the right on web, it will bring up uh, the, the web version of the system. Um, it, it has the, the same underlying mechanisms as, uh, as, e as uh, on the other platforms. I'll do vlist list at the dictionary here. Um, 
uh, sort of all, all the plumbing is there. So if I, if I do, if I define a word, uh, let's say I do test and I'll do for I print next turn, I can print things out. I can do C on that word uh, and it will attempt to decompile it. Um, and uh, and, and uh, the same is true of all, all the words in the system that are defined in higher level words. So for example, I've got this word fill 32, which is part of the system and you can decode and, and see the inner, inner op codes for it. Um, the, uh, um, as I mentioned, there's, there's a little bit of support for graphics. Uh, I took a little inspiration from, from the Apple II, Apple II uh, and have a word set that uh, GR will bring you into a mode where there's graphics above and, and you continue to have the terminal down below. Um, you can uh, set the color. Uh, I'll, let's say we do a red. Red is uh, in, in the, uh, the value color. And then I can draw a box. Uh, the coordinate system by default starts at uh, 1,000 by 1,000. Um, there's actually words to, to redefine it, which I'll, I'll endeavor to document on the website at some point soon. Uh, but you can, for example, draw a box. Um, and uh, there's, you, can, um, you can disable the, the visibility of the uh, actually show text. Uh, you can hide the text and get to sort of a full graphic screen. Um, if you want to get the, the scrolling on the side there to go away, uh, actually here, well, take page. Uh, I'm going to re-enable. Can't see what I'm typing. One show. Three. Um, and you can go back to text mode with just the word text. Um, likely there will be more. Right now, box is the only word that draws anything. Um, this this fourth has vocabularies and, and the works uh, like like the others. Uh, if you go into the internals vocabulary, you can see some of the stuffing. So, for example, there's that F's float uh, word that we were talking about earlier, um, and you can examine all sort of all of the insides. So, if you examine, you can even see the insides of C. And if you want to see see the insides of the words that are in there, you can go examine them. Um, we can very briefly look at the, uh, if you go into the JavaScript console, you can see the source code. You can see the source code, by the way, on GitHub as well. But um, to give you an idea, the web page here uh, contains very little to bootstrap things. Uh, this is actually all plumbing for the, the menu at the top. But to actually embed it is just these two lines at the bottom. The, the interpreter itself lives down here. Um, and as you see, it, it starts out with, um, uh, a, a few constants, and then uh, the very first thing is actually just this gigantic fourth string, uh, which contains the all of the bootstrapping code. Some of this, of course, looks like JavaScript because it's JavaScript, but you'll notice that it's actually embedded in this uh, multi-line uh, string that I've defined in fourth uh, to be passed over. So it's sort of mixing JavaScript and and fourth, and then way down here you get to the point where you actually see the insides and the uh, this is the result of having compiled the C and then converted. And so uh, there is a, or sorry, compiled in, in C, extracted the set of opcodes. Uh, and so things are a little bit more splayed out than they are in the C version. Um, and there's a few helper words that are one line macros that are multi line in, in, in fourth. But you'll see that, you know, you've got words like uh, create here. And uh, there is, there are some. There's, here's parse, here's uh, convert, which is that S convert and so on. Um, and then most of the bottom of this is actually just a table to build up the, the set of words and, uh, and then some initialization code. Uh, and oh, and here's the, here's the opcodes splayed out in asm.js in a gigantic switch state. Uh, in any event, uh, that, there it is. Uh, uh, check it out. I'll, I'll be trying to bring it up to parity and support things like color in the terminal and uh, stuff like that uh, uh, in future version, uh, revisions. Are there any questions? Very cool. Check it out. So there I was operating in zombie mode the past uh, three or four days, unable to get the uh, agenda posted. 
when uh, fortuitously uh, a, a talk appeared in the queue as if by magic, uh, indirect threaded code uh, profiler. So uh, how long did you estimate your talk to, uh, to last? I think um, last time it took me half an hour. Uh, I expect to be a little bit faster this time. Okay, if you can get the ball across the plate in 20 minutes, that will work out nicely. Uh, I think what we're going to do is bump the Dr. Ting stuff. You all have access to it on our YouTube channel. Does anybody not know where the YouTube channel that cares where the YouTube channel is? All right, that's good. Good reaction. Uh, <laughs> dazed. Uh, huh? Okay, so on with the show.